So we're going to be taking a look at solutions. Um, uh, at this point, uh, the chapter uh, regarding solutions should have been read, so this should be more of a review than um, anything particularly new. So what is a solution? So basically a solution is a homogeneous or homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. Um, so basically uniform throughout and a basically a combo of two or more things um, in a in a specific mixture. Now the solute um, or solutes are the things that are dissolved um, into what is known as the solvent and usually the solute is the thing that's present in the smaller amount. Uh, the solvent um, as I mentioned is the substance that's actually doing the dissolving of the solute. So a solution is a homogeneous mixture that consists of two or more substances, uh, at least one of them being a solute and at least one of them being a solvent. The solvent does the dissolving of the solute. Um, and solutions can consist of many different types. You can have gas-gas mixtures, gas-liquid, gas-solids, liquid-liquid, solid-liquid, and even solid-solid uh, solutions. Um, so basically uh, the, the mixing of the components don't even have to be in the same phase. So this allows us to have um, various different types of solutions, various different types of mixtures, um, from gases uh, to liquid and gas mixtures to solid and solid mixtures. So a solution um, can be varied, <clears throat> and it just depends on what's present. So solutions are going to be described in um, one of three ways. They're either going to be saturated, unsaturated, or supersaturated. So a saturated solution is going to have um, a maximum amount of the solute um, dissolved in a specific amount of solvent at a specific temperature. Um, so basically, once you can no longer dissolve any solute into the solvent, you have a saturated solution. Um, and that's assuming you know the temperature is being kept constant. An unsaturated solution is basically a solution that has less solute um, then the solvent could potentially dissolve um, at a specific temperature. So, you know, as you're adding, say, salt to um, a glass of water, okay, uh, you add a couple of grades of salt, you have an unsaturated solution. That salt, sodium chloride salt, completely dissolves into the water, um, but the water is still uh, capable of dissolving more of the sodium chloride. Um, so as you continue to add salt, you're going to get to a point where um, no more sodium chloride can be dissolved into uh, the water, and so you're going to get to the point where you have a saturated solution. Um, now, a supersaturated solution is kind of unique, and in the case of supersaturated solutions, you can go past the saturation point. Um, in this case, though, we usually have to increase our temperature um, in order to actually uh, get additional uh, solute to dissolve. So uh, an example of this um, from, you know, your guys' day-to-day, uh, interactions with, uh, solutions might be, say, a, a glass of tea. Um, so if you have, uh, some sugar and, um, a cold, uh, glass of tea, you can add a certain amount of sugar. It doesn't dissolve very well. However, if I were to take a hot cup of tea or a hot glass of tea with the same volume of tea, um, I would be able to dissolve significantly more, um, sugar into that solution. So basically I can, you know, continue to add, uh, sugar, continue to add sugar, and eventually I'll have a solution, um, that has gone beyond the saturation point. So the process of making solutions depends on two major factors. It depends on the tendency of substances to randomly mix with one another, and it depends on the intermolecular interactions that are involved in the solution process. And we're going to look at both of these um, independently uh, and, and basically uh, help us understand. That's going to help us understand the solution-making process. So mixing is a spontaneous process. So what do we mean by that? We mean it just happens. It just, it, it, it's what occurs. Um, and it doesn't really require any energy input. And um, so we've understood this previously when we discussed gases. Um, basically, if you put two gases um, into a container, um, they're going to diffuse past one another and basically um, distribute uniformly throughout the container. 
Um, so this mixing process, it just, it just happens. It's what, what occurs. Um, and this, uh, basic, uh, process, um, is referred to as entropy or, um, basically a thermodynamic quantity that's, uh, related to the disorder associated with the mixing process. So we're going to discuss entropy in more detail, um, when we get into, uh, second semester work. But for now, if we just understand that mixing is a spontaneous process um, associated with disorder and that we refer to that as entropy, um, you should be fine in terms of your understanding of the mixing process. Um, so, as I said, the entropy is referred to or, or associated with disorder, um, and it determines basically the mixing or the spreading out of the substances within a mixture. Um, so when you allow things to mix, entropy um, increases. So basically the disorder increases. Um, so we've used the examples of gases mixing. You know, if we have, uh, two gases separated, um, and then basically allowed to interact by, you know, opening a stopcock or removing the barrier that keeps them separate, um, entropy is going to basically lead to the random mixing of those gases and you're going to have a uniform mixture. Now, solution-based mixing is a little bit different, and the reason why is because we have to consider the intermolecular forces um, associated uh, with um, the combination or the, the mixing process that's going to occur. So, you know, in gases, we assume that they behave in the ideal um, fashion, so the intermolecular forces are kind of a moot point. Um, however, obviously this entropy factor is, is, you know, the determining or the driving force, um, for the mixing process. But when we deal with solutions, we have to consider the entropy aspect, you know, that disorder is, is also present. However, the intermolecular forces, um, start to play a bigger role. So, you know, we've referred or we've looked at our intermolecular forces, um, in previous lectures, we've looked at, you know, uh, London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, things of that sort. Now, in terms of the intermolecular force effect uh, affecting solutions, um, we have to consider the three types of um, intermolecular interactions that are occurring within a solution. So <clears throat> our first option or our first uh, thing to look at is our solute-solute interaction. So basically, you know, the, the interaction of the molecules of the thing that's being dissolved. Okay, um, we then are going to look at our solvent-solvent interactions. Okay, so whatever the thing that is doing the dissolving, there are intermolecular forces between those molecules. So those have to be considered. And then the last thing we're going to look at is the solvent-solute interaction. So as the mixing process occurs, um, eventually we're going to have the solvent and the solutes interacting um, and basically producing our solution. So the magnitude or the ability for something to dissolve is going to be dictated by all three of these interactions um, and their relative magnitudes and signs and things of that sort. So we're going to look at the enthalpy values associated with solute-solute, solvent-solvent, and solvent-solute interactions. So the energy of making solutions or the enthalpy of solution as we see here, delta H of solution, um, is the energy change associated with actually making a solution. Okay, and we need to break the solution process into a couple steps. So uh, first step we're going to look at is breaking apart the solvent-solvent interactions, um, breaking apart the solute-solute interactions, and then the formation of solvent-solute interactions. So notice, um, we're breaking apart these um, solvent, solvent, and solute, solute interactions, and we're actually forming solvent, solute interactions. So the enthalpy values associated with these steps um, can be um, analyzed, and we can utilize Hess's law in order to help us figure out the overall de delta H of the solution process. So we know from Hess's law. Um, that we can sum the individual steps of a reaction or of a process um, and figure out the overall enthalpy value of that process or that reaction. 
Um, so in this case, we're going to be looking at the individual steps associated with solution making processes. So, so basically, we're going to look at the enthalpy or the energy associated with breaking apart the solute-solute intermolecular forces. We're going to look at the enthalpy value associated with the breaking apart of the solvent-solvent intermolecular forces. And we're going to look at the enthalpy value associated with the interactions or the intermolecular forces between the solvent and the solute particles. So when we're breaking apart our solvent, we're happy to overcome attractive forces between the solvent-solvent molecules. So if our solvent is water, we're uh, breaking apart those hydrogen bonds. Or if our solvent is, say, pentane, we're breaking apart those London dispersion forces. So in order to overcome those attractive forces, energy has to be put into this process. So in order to break apart solvent-solvent molecules, we have to add energy. Okay, so our delta H of our solvent is always going to be positive. Um, the next step that we're going to look at is the breaking apart of our solute, solute interactions. Um, and much of the same way that we uh, thought about or analyzed our solvent-solvent interactions, our solute-solute interactions are going to have to be um, absorbing or taking in energy in order to inter interfere or break apart those intermolecular forces between the solute molecules. Okay, so um, much like the delta H of the solvent, the delta H of the solute is also going to be greater than zero. Okay, so energy has to be put into um, both breaking apart solvent-solvent interactions and solute-solute interactions. Now this brings us to the third portion of solution processes. So remember the delta H of your mixture is, is actually looking at the interactions between your solvent and your solute. Okay, so in this case, um, we're looking at how solvent and solute come together. Okay, so um, where in solvent-solvent or solute-solute interactions, we might be breaking apart, you know, London dispersion forces, or we might be breaking apart hydrogen bonds, depending on what the molecules are. Um, in the case of the delta H of the mixture, we're actually forming these intermolecular forces. Or and so in this case, the delta H of the mixture, the value and the sign is really going to depend on what you're mixing. Okay, so um, molecules that attract each other um, are going to give you a negative delta H of your mixture. Okay, so if you're uh, if you have a solvent and a solute that are both polar, you're going to end up with interactions that are um, attractive. So um, solvent, solute, okay, if I have, say, um, polar interactions, polar interactions, so like dipole-dipole, ion-dipole, things of that sort, um, those molecules will interact, okay? If I have nonpolar, nonpolar interactions, you know, those molecules will interact, okay? But when I end up with molecules that are nonpolar and, say, polar, okay, whether it's the solvent or the solute, okay, they're not going to actually want to interact with one another. So that's going to lead to um, basically delta H values um, that are either... Uh, less negative, or we can look at it as being more positive or closer to zero potentially as well. Um, so depending on what kind of solvent-solute interactions, that's really going to dictate uh, the um, creation of a solution or whether or not it will form. Um, so uh, if your delta H of your solution, so if the overall value for your delta H of a solution is very large and positive, um, your solution is unlikely to form. So what does that mean? We know that the delta H of solute and solvent are always going to be positive, okay, because we're always breaking apart um, those attractive forces. Now, it's the delta H of the mixture is really going to be the determining factor on to whether or not a solution actually um, happens. So depending on the types of interactions that you have between the solvent and the solute to make that mixture, 
Um, that's going to dictate the side as well as the magnitude of your delta H of mixture, and that in turn is going to affect the delta H of solution. So, you know, you already know that the delta H of solute and solvent are going to be positive. You know, if you have a big positive number for your delta H of mixture because you have molecules that don't want to interact with one another, um, you're going to end up with a delta H of solution that's very... Uh, large and positive and basically a solution is not going to form. Um, so it's not to say that a positive delta H of solution means that no solution forms, it just can't be positive and large. Okay, so uh, basically that's going to be affected by what types of molecules you have in that mixture that is forming.